I had moved to southeast Washington for work after college. The Blue Mountains were very close by, and being a hunter, I was very interested in learning the land for hunting season. I went on several solo scouting trips into various areas, always picking locations that would put me the farthest from any public road or access point. I find in hunting that most people are too lazy to get much off the roads, so less competition in the remote areas. Being outdoors has never been anything new to me. I grew up on a farm and ranch in Montana and have spent most of my youth working outside and dealing with animals. Not only would I have to tend to the various livestock, but I was raised into hunting and above all enjoy calling animals. I was ten when I fooled my first coyote that I was a dying jackrabbit and since then have mimicked everything from rodents to bull elk well enough to fool predators and big game routinely. I know with the explosion of bow hunting popularity that animal calls have become more commonplace, but I don't think you can appreciate it to the same extent a country boy can that learn how to echo back the calls of cattle, horses, chickens, etc., before old enough to attend school. I'm not bragging here. I'm just laying the groundwork that I have a very trained ear for animal calls. So I set out one afternoon to run up the blues to scout for game. I got a late start but no real worries as most of the spotting of animal activity occurs at first and last light. I was able to only hike a couple miles from the road before I needed to find a spot to camp and watch for game. I climbed up a ridge and found a small, somewhat level spot to set camp. I had a pretty good view of the surrounding area, but ended up only seeing a couple of whitetails before dark. I kept a dry camp, no fire, and just turned in early for the night to get a good start in the morning. I was awoken at about 1 a.m. to probably the worst headache I have ever had. It would be just a surge of pain, then taper off, then come back. I was very careful about my hydration on the pack in, so I knew it wasn't dehydration, about my only real concern on the trip. So I'm lying in my bivy with this on again off. Again, pulse of pain, trying my best to diagnose the cause, when my ears finally tuned to this strange sound coming from the mountainside above me. My thoughts moved from the headache to this animal call. It's not matching any of the calls I know. It's not matching any of the general patterns I know. It's too loud and repetitive. It's unique. It's very, very strange. I know instantly that this is a large mammalian call. You can say, how do I know that? And all I can say is I have a lifetime experience, like I stated above. It's definitely a mammal. It's big, with a deep, hollow vocal chamber, and although this is evident, I tell myself it is likely some W.A. bird to ease my mind. After all, Washington must have different birds than Montana. So now I'm stuck that if I focus on the sound, I can't believe my bullshit that it is a bird, and as soon as I try to not think about the sound, the surging pain of my headache is unbearable. Close to 2 a.m., I make a judgment call and pull camp and head back to the truck, with this call repeating the whole time before this decision. The way I hiked to my camp was pretty direct, but rough. However, there was a gated road just above my camp that circled back of the main road where my truck was parked. Distance would be longer to follow the road, but easier to travel in the night. Also, it led me directly towards this call before it would start to circle back to the truck. So with my 1911 in hand, I walked that road out. The interesting part is the sound stayed above me as I walked out, always directly up the mountainside and after climbing up to the road, only maybe 200. 300 yards distant, the animal clearly shadowed my departure, following along up the mountain, a ways. As soon as I dropped down out of the mountains, my headache completely cleared. I have since decided this was likely attributed to altitude sickness, since I was also having a hard time regulating my breathing. The real fun came when I got home and had to start searching bird sounds for Washington. At this point, about 3-4 a.m., my search was not producing anything close to what I had heard. That small nagging voice finally had me Google Bigfoot call, and damn if I didn't find an audio file of what I had just heard almost instantly. 
That call was so unique that on my drive home, I grabbed a mouth read and was able to duplicate it quite quickly. There is no doubt in my mind about what I heard. Of course, I have doubt of any sound on the Internet labeled Bigfoot whoops, because who can say what call a mythological creature really makes, and how could you ever be sure? I can say that I never heard it again, even on return trips to that area. I even walked through the area it originated from, and it was a thick, nasty north slope face full of trees and vegetation. Let me start off with a few disclaimers. This isn't my story. It's a friend of my grandfather, and it's been a few years since I was told it, so the memory might be a bit hazy. It may not be scary to most people, but I thought I would share it anyway. Also, if there are any mistakes in the story, I apologize. At the time of writing this, I was getting over a concussion. This story happened in upstate New York. My grandfather's friend was hunting with one other person. For privacy reasons, I won't use any names of the people in this story. Anyway, they came across a road and decided to split up, going in opposite directions on the road. He perched himself on a rock and waited till about four in the afternoon, but nothing showed. At this time, he decided to meet up with his friend. Right when he got off the rock he was sitting on, he saw something walking in the woods across a clearing not far from him. The thing walked out of the trees, and it had its right side facing him. He didn't know if it was a bear or a person, and he didn't know whether to talk to it or not. He then decided to whistle at it. The thing walked away from him on two legs back into the forest. It disappeared from his sight. It then walked back out of the forest, this time facing him. They stared at each other before the thing walked back into the woods again and out of sight. My grandfather's friend walked back down the road away from the thing he saw, where he saw his friend walking up to him. He asked him if he had been down where he saw the creature. He said he never went down that way. To this day, he insists that it wasn't a bear because it would have stumbled on two legs, and he swears it wasn't a person because they would have alerted him to their presence. He insists that it was a Bigfoot. This is coming from a second-hand source, so you can judge on whether or not it's true but I hope to find out what he saw. What I'm about to tell you is very true. I've never told anyone in my life till now. This happened to me back in 2003 at our family farm in Ohio. It was mid-October and my dad and I were on our way to the farm to deer hunt, as we always did every weekend. We arrived there around 5.45 in the morning. We sat in the truck talking and joking about who was going to see more deer or shoot the bigger buck like always. At about five minutes till six, we got out and got our gear on and headed towards the woods. As we entered the woods on the left side of the cow pasture, I noticed an odd eerie feeling, which was normal for me, I guess, as the woods always gave me that feeling, even since I was young. My dad walked me to my tree stand and made sure I got in and situated safely. He told me good luck, as always, and I said I'll be back at noon. He then proceeded to his stand. A few minutes after he left, this overwhelmingly tingle came over my body, as if someone or something was watching me. At this time, it was still dark. I began to look around the surrounding timber, trying to make out silhouettes, but couldn't. I was beginning to become very overwhelmed with that feeling of eyes upon me. A few minutes had passed since I scanned the timber last. I tried once more since my eyes had now adjusted to the dark better. I looked off to my left and then slowly towards my right again, and nothing. I tried to calm myself and mentally say it's nothing. You're fine. All of a sudden I heard crashing coming towards me from the left, and my heart sank as I looked. It was a few deer running for what appeared to be their life. They blew through the woods and didn't stop. I heard them still crashing through the timber. At this time, I was only able to make out silhouettes and outlines of trees. I thought that it was odd, but maybe a coyote or something was after them, and I just shrugged it off. Maybe five minutes later, it was still dark, but dawn approached. I then felt the hair on my neck stand up, and that eerie feeling came back upon me. 
My heart started to pound profusely. I heard the crunching of leaves and loud snaps of sticks from the direction the deer had run from, which was the neighbor's property on the left side of our woods. There were one hundred plus acres of switchgrass and hundreds of acres of other woods. I looked up and saw what appeared to be my dad walking towards me. Daylight was starting to break now, but it was still pretty dark inside the woods. I waited for what I thought was my dad, and he got about twenty yards plus from me. I quietly said, What are you doing, Dad? No response. It just continued to walk towards me. So I said a little louder, Dad, what are you doing? Still no response. I began to say, Hey, you know you're trespassing, buddy, but no response. As it got to the tree that my deer stand was in, I noticed that it was not my dad. I began to freak out. I looked across the woods to where my dad's tree stand was, and I saw his headlamp climbing up the tree. That's when I looked down and saw this thing standing directly underneath my tree stand, looking dead at me. Whatever it was, it was tall enough to reach up and grab my foot with ease. Mind you, I'm fourteen feet up this tree. I began to start crying from fear, and my heart was beating so hard and fast I thought it was going to explode out of my chest. I let out a wimpy, muffled air yell. It just grumbled at me and walked off, following the direction of the deer. I watched it disappear into the timber as the darkness was fading fast. Once it was gone, I was overwhelmed with this god-awful smell of body odor mixed with the smell of death, old hound dog, and trash. As the morning went on, the woods were dead silent. Not a bird, squirrel, or deer, nothing. I've never heard the woods that quiet before, ever. Once I calmed down enough to climb down and out of my tree, I ran to my dad and told him I wanted to leave because I didn't feel well. So we left. This happened to me when I was 15. I'm now 29, and I've never hunted our woods in the morning again. I will not be there after dark to this day, and I still have not told anyone until now. I do not smoke, drink, or do drugs. Never have. I promise this is a 100% true story and the scariest thing that's ever happened. I was staying in a cabin on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland in the mountains. One day we were snowed in, and when you're snowed in in there, you're stuck, basically. Now, there are plenty of bears and deer up there. We kept salt licks, corn, and all kinds of stuff around, not to hunt, but just to feed them. Well, I walked by the back window, which is over the underground garage where we kept the snowmobiles and four-wheelers. I see this big brownish thing in the woods, probably fifty feet from the cabin, just sitting in the snow. I was shocked because I had never really seen a bear there, but I heard the stories about them being around. So I ran to get my mom to show her. As we walked back to the window, the damn thing stood up. And I don't mean like a bear, I mean like a big tall man standing up. It then turned around and walked with a huge stride and basically took off into the woods. We stood there, shocked. What the hell was that? My uncle just says, Oh, that's a squatch. He's a celebrity around here. I don't know if he was just trying to make us feel better by diffusing the situation with a comedic remark, but after that, I never went to those woods alone again. There, that's my encounter. I am a 32-year-old female from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks, all that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Tumbleson Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park, and I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dogs and bears, and I can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted 
with animal anatomy. Was I ever into paleontology? Yes, I was a Dino crazy little girl. My one babysitter had readers digest mysteries of the unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaurus in Scotland or an apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing, but I believed in them as much as a forester believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It did seem to me, though, that it seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about ten. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though it's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch, or sitting on it, should I say. It sounded like it. No one was home. No media was on, and yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of the furniture being dragged right under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though we just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike, but even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Hell, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I think it was a horse that had gotten loose, but when I'd go out to investigate, I wouldn't find the thing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names rather than think of names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 and 19 in this particular encounter and by this time we gave up on cows. I hate cows and just had horses and chickens. Someone knocked at the door, and it was at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep for two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbors said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working at the time, and that was nothing new. This lot of horses had three experts and escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after some time. When it was cloudy, you could literally have to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch black. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone to the fence again. It happened a lot, believe it or not. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads and paused for a moment to see if there was any other horse or horses that had replied. To the horse I had heard squeal. That would give me an idea of where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse the woods and lead them back. Even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky trip. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. The land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven-acre pasture, pretty much in the center on the outside edge of a large pasture, was an old white barn that we turned into a run. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture, just to keep her from escaping. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho horse. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eyes were really showing. Was I alarmed? No, as I said, psycho. 
I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny fenced an area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced in area with a tiny door. Three of those horses were over sixteen hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough that he touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral, and the last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger running them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine, and I'm thirty-two now. I've had ponies and horses, a couple of different Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, and other thoroughbreds and mustangs, all different kinds. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life, I'll tell you. They consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, no matter what breed it is, especially not in a group. They were just silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed any help, but I told him no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares didn't like men. I told him I'd take them out one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead them out. They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit was only 35, but people go 60 all the time. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved by their strange behavior, so I led them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish at first, though picking at the hay I threw out, walking around relentlessly, sticking to the barn like glue and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalized it by thinking it's the Abby flipping out. That's unnerving them. Why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures. Out of habit, I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the Abby was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it cast a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panicked gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of the pasture. Again, the pasture was unlit and full of springs. Sometime, though during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to be seen. The spot on the road, though, where I was at, was paved and pretty well lit. My neighbor was paranoid. I'd almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I'd like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eyes shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why, besides it being where my horse was going nuts. Tix told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture, and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. 
The pasture itself is sloped to deal with a runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight on one of them. It was next to this thing. It was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen, standing there watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil, and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you asked your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind with a sinking stomach. I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eye shine. I didn't see any, though, so I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there watching frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off, glancing at me sideways a few times. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noise. I stood there a long time after, looking for the eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I don't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs on this uneven, inclined ground. I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up-and-down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before, and he made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point and considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack with them. They'd be gone in the morning and my mom would be pissed. So, I darted over and grabbed them and ran like a bat out of hell. I should have left the tack. I know you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got to the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch, black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses, I'd have a warning, and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves me that whatever it was was watching me for however long. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping my mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her? Or was it in the unlit barn I walked through to get to the road? Was it the reason a psycho mar swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find out how they got out. Did they panic and jump? I did check the fence line away from the woods, and I did look for other tracks from the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost in the morning, but I will say the Abbey mare was running for a good while and the ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. To this day, I'm not quite sure what it was that I felt and experienced. I just hope that it never comes back around my horses ever again. I was hiking with friends up in this particular canyon almost 20 years ago, maybe more. It was night, and I'm sure we were not supposed to be there after dark. We were all just young and dumb kids. It was about an hour or two hike up to this waterfall, but it was dry this particular year. We only had flashlights and light sabers. Like I said, young and dumb. Cell phones weren't a big thing then. We got to the base of the waterfall, and we noticed a memorial with shoes tied on. They were fairly small shoes. We got up closer and there was a laminated note with a picture of a boy in his teens explaining he had fallen and died at that spot. It was from family and how he was dearly missed. It happened exactly one year on that same day. We immediately hiked back down with no rest, freaking the F out. No picture proof, but it happened. was out hiking in a canyon at around 2.30 a.m. I could hear coyotes yipping a couple miles away, but wasn't too scared. 
A power transmission line runs at the bottom of the canyon, and it makes a crackle sound at night when the moisture is high. I noticed a power company service van working with a cherry picker up on the line, but didn't think it was weird, probably fixing a power issue. As I got closer, I noticed the workmen were wearing what looked like motorcycle helmets that completely covered their face. They had floodlights on, and I could see the van was white with no logo. I was about 200 yards away and thought it was strange, but kept walking. I glanced over again, and all three men stopped working. One had come down off the crane silently and gathered with the others together perfectly still, facing my direction. I completely froze. With those helmets on, I couldn't tell what they were looking at, but their bodies all faced me, and they weren't taking to each other. I could see their helmets were solid white and didn't have reflective shields or anything to look through. At that point, I panicked and bolted. I glanced over my shoulder, and one was following me, but not actually moving, just somehow moved closer and standing still. While running, I remember thinking I never actually saw any of them move. That freaked me out and left the trail and ran off road straight to the nearest house. I didn't look back until I was a good half mile away. When I did look, the van was there, but the men were gone. I kept running and eventually made it home. I was a high school counselor and years ago I had a conversation with a student that I still think about a lot. Wondering what you, you all make of it. He was a good kid, not a liar, troublemaker or anything. He wasn't mentally ill. He came into my office one day very excited because he read a library book. Can't remember which one. That made him remember some experiences from childhood that he had forgotten until then. He remembered often being in the woods on his ranch in Mexico and communicating with little people, like fairies or elves, who lived among the flowers and plants. He proceeded to tell me that there were three angels standing behind me. He said the angels knew that I was worried about my adult son and I shouldn't worry that he was going to be fine. I had been very worried about my son, but there's no way this student would have known. Sure. He could have been crazy or making it up, but the weirdest part is that the second I had a thought in my head, he'd say the angel said you thought such and such, and he was correct every time. The conversation went on for a long time, and I can't explain it. He graduated soon after it, and I run into him a couple of times, but nothing else significant. Thoughts? I was at a Korean community grocery store in September 2015. I went to buy some items, and as I was approaching the counter to pay, I noticed this twitchy small woman, young in her mid-twenties, I'm guessing, but she looked like she was in the DTS in need of a fix. It's a shame, really. I thought she would have been pretty if all cleaned up. Well, I still thought she was pretty. She was asking for matches, but she had no money. I made my payment and asked for matches for the lady, and it was just then, at the corner of my eye, I saw a darker, then dark mass just behind her, but taller. I turned my head and looked directly at it. It was moving like iron filings that would shift as you moved a magnet, but not unlike an insect. Its eyes were bright like diamond white, and angular like a diamond, but on the side. Its head was also pointed, and the head and back were not unlike a planarian worm. The weird thing is I looked down, and I saw the lady's arms and legs were wrapped from behind and underneath her appendages, and the thing's body was pressed so close, like a piece of clothing or blanket. That's when it moved like an insert, would like a twitch. When it moved, so did the lady. Then, as I look at its face, just above her head, like someone peering over someone, just not fully, it turned and looked directly at me. I have to tell you, I knew enough from experience that you do not show fear and remain calm when all you want to do is scream and point and run, which I really wanted to do. I acted like I was looking through it and looked around, not caring that I was just seen and almost ran. The clerk handed her the matches, and she thanked me. Then I left. As I left, I was looking straight ahead. 
but internally I was concentrating behind me, wondering if it was still looking at me. All this time happened in under a minute. I began wondering what I had seen and drew it once I got home. I showed my siblings a few days later and told them what happened. They claimed it could be a possession or a den. I'm still not sure. But know this. I look at people now differently who are on drugs or under the influence. How they move or walk is exactly like how this creature moves. What if that is true and part of the reason why they can't stop? You know, if you watch zombie movies like Walking Dead, they kind of move like that too. It's just a weird way they walk and shuffle. I haven't seen anything like this before, nor since. Maybe you or your reader might know what the heck I saw. This occurred in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Best regards... Me and a friend were part of a caving club about seven, eight years ago. A group of people that likes to climb around deep caves and such. We were in a really deep cave in the Austrian Alps. Can't remember the name of it. It was unpronounceable. So we've been climbing ever deeper for hours on end, and we're currently making our way across the ledge of a chasm. Imagine a very deep hole with two entrances at the very top. We were laying our ropes from entrance to entrance. The entire thing was maybe 20, 25 meters across, so no easy thing to do. We were about hallway across with my friend ahead of me when suddenly there's the most creepy and subtly evil howl coming from below, from the complete darkness under us, accompanied by a blast of stale, warm air. Now you may have been afted, maybe even horrified, but nothing, and I say nothing in my life since that day has ever compared to the dread and sheer horror I felt while hanging on a thin wire over a hole that's God knows how deep while we have nothing but a small lantern as a light source. We just kind of hung there for a minute, not really sure what to do when my friend finally got his bearings and awakened me from that paralysis. We made our way across and were on our way to the deepest point. But I was still very, very shaken from that. I've researched and found that it was most likely just air that's been trapped down there for a few thousand years and that got released when we were overhead, and the sound was the caves being caves and all. But I wasn't able to get it out of my head for months after that, and I just kind of stopped caving after that. I actually have a story that happened in the late 70s. I was a teenager. What happened was I was coming home in a car with my boyfriend and it was late at night. We were coming home from a party and we were on a country road that was very, very deserted. All cattails and shrubs by a lake on the backside of a lake. There were a couple of farms out there but nothing on the stretch of road we were on. And there were a lot of bends in the road so we couldn't go too fast. We came around a sharp bend in the road, and standing right there was this huge creature, about eight feet tall, hairy. I did not know what a Bigfoot was then. I did not know what to make of it. I thought it was part human and part ape, and then I thought maybe it was somebody in a costume or something. I was so frightened. I remember my boyfriend saying, lock the doors. Lock the doors. We had these manual locks, and I was able to quickly lock my door, but I couldn't turn around. I was too scared to turn around and lock that back seat door. I was just frozen because of this creature. We were going around 45 miles per hour because you couldn't go too fast around these curves. This creature was right next to my window, running at that speed, keeping up with the car, trying to open the door. He couldn't open the door. Finally, that road straightened out. We were able to accelerate and were able to lose him then. When we accelerated, we just tore out of there. We were both so frightened. It was like a nightmare, something I'll never forget. When we got home, I was sharing that story with my family, and my sister was like, It's a Bigfoot. It's a Bigfoot. I'd never even thought of a Bigfoot. I just thought, What is this thing? She just came out of the woods and started racing after the car.
The witness was later asked if she saw the creature's face. She stated, I was too afraid when we first approached and came in contact with the creature. When the car slowed down on the curb right next to it, when it was standing there, it was eye to eye. After that, it was just a race to get out of there, and I was too scared. I couldn't even lock that back door. He was right next to the car, running a couple of feet from the car, trying to get to the door handle, and my boyfriend said, We ought to get out to here. This is horrible. You never think you're going to see something like that in this area at night. I live on Long Island. The beach I go to has a jetty of just huge boulders. When I was about ten and my younger sister was eight, we found an opening towards the front that was just big enough to submit the passage of a small body. We crawled through, the water up to our knees. Looking back, this was an incredibly stupid thing to do. The tide could have come in at any moment, and we were underneath giant rocks. However, I digress. The jetty wasn't wide, maybe about 12 feet from one side to the other, after we had been crawling for about 7 feet. We came to a bit of a sandy hill. It was absolutely covered in dead animals. Mice, rats, birds, you name it. They were skinned. Who put them there? They weren't animals you'd typically find at the beach. And were they replenishing them? High tide would certainly reach that place, sweeping them all away. We pretty much rapid speed army crawled our way back out, didn't attempt to explore again. My daughter and I were hiking behind Shaver Lake, California, in Fresno County. We kept hearing strange whooping sounds that were all around us, sometimes far away. Others are very near. We also could smell something bad from time to time. We came up on a pretty meadow where the odor was exceptionally bad. We took a shortcut through an area that had just been cut. The ground was bare earth. I was keeping my eye on the ground because I like to watch for animal tracks. It's a habit of mine. I saw a huge footprint. I even have a picture of it somewhere, with a smashed spider in the print that it stepped on. I noticed there were more. I actually followed them up the side of a hill, thinking it had to be bear print. But each and every print was shaped like a human foot, not a paw. At one point, the prints were sideways as if looking back down the hill. My daughter pointed out that whatever it is, I'm following it and might be up at the top watching me. So I ran back down to where my daughter was waiting. There was a stand of trees right on the edge of the meadow where we followed the odor. In the middle of the close circle of trees was a huge mound of scat. Now I'm not talking about bears or mountain lions. I know what they look like. This was piled at least one foot high and had the look of a very huge human feces, but smelled horrible. This spooked us because we were thinking whatever made that is huge and could still be close by because it looked fresh. All the way back off that trail, we were followed by that whooping sound. I'm getting goosebumps just telling this. So that's it. Now we are too scared to go hiking back there without any men with us. I absolutely believe there is a Bigfoot. We lived on my grandfather's property in the early 1970s. He had about 75 acres in southern Ontario, Canada, near French River Provincial Park. On the property was a swamp. We hunted bullfrogs in the summer. There was also a beaver meadow that gave us an eerie feeling, as if we shouldn't be there. Many times there were no sounds in that area, almost a dead zone. Occasionally we heard a knocking wood sound, but at the time it was not a thing that we knew about Bigfoot. We didn't know creatures would do that. My grandfather had an old sap shanty along the meadow that was in disrepair and it had started to shift and fall over. The weird feelings that we got when we were there were creepy. One night, five of my friends and I were taunting each other to ride our minibikes back to the beaver meadow in the dark. I was lucky enough not to need an excuse to participate as my headlight wasn't working. 
Then we noticed a small but bright light coming from the beaver meadow, and it hovered about 40 feet off the ground. It didn't move until all of us were looking at it. It suddenly veered to the left, fast enough to leave a light streak, like a sparkler when you swing it around. Then it stopped. Then it would start again for a few seconds. Then it would stop. This continued for about 10 minutes until it started to expand and change its shape. It was not saucer shaped nor egg shaped. It was more oblong. No lights were flashing and the whole craft gave off a bright white light. As we watched it seemed to grow ever so slightly, so slow that it took a few seconds for us to realize it was moving towards us. The area it had come up out of was about a quarter mile away from us. There was nothing in the field to impede our view. It was a cool night, and no insects were making a sound. At about 50 or so meters from us, we saw it clearly. It was bright white, with no windows or external markings. The closer it came, the clearer we could see what looked like a single object emitting a light that seemed to create a circle directly under it. It never sped up or slowed down until it hovered directly over our small group. It stopped without any sound and stayed in place for what seemed to have been a minute or two. We could see it was around ten meters above us. It didn't spin or hum. It just hovered. We didn't feel any movement of air, no heat or any other sensation. But we were in awe at what we were witnessing. Then suddenly it took off straight up and blended into a pinpoint of light among the sea of stars above us. We stood around for about an hour or so, trying to figure out what we had just seen. Just before we were ready to leave for the night, we started to hear the wood knocking coming from the woods along the beaver meadow. Frankly, it scared us. We quickly got on our motorbikes and hauled our butts out of there. The next summer, three of us were near the beaver meadow one early evening. As the light started to fade, we again observed a very bright white object hovering near the woods. Suddenly we heard four distinct and loud wood knocks that were followed by a deep growling roar. We were frozen in shock. We looked in the direction of the woods and saw several lighted objects rising out of the woods, ascending above the trees and quickly moving up into the darkening sky. Then we heard four more wood knocks and crashing sounds in the woods. We quickly got out of the area. That was the last time that I ever visited the Beaver Meadow. My grandfather sold the property not long after that and moved to Guelph, Ontario. I never found out why he sold the property, but I do know that he did so quickly. A male employee, approximately 62 years old, working at a water treatment facility on the east side of Cincinnati, was conducting his nightly rounds. He needed to drive to a specific tank and open a valve. As he drove down a rural road dotted with houses, he noticed something standing in front of a garage on his right, illuminated by bright overhead light. He put his truck in reverse and backed up to get a better look, eventually stopping at the foot of the driveway. The creature he saw was standing roughly where an SUV was parked on the right side. The image on the right reveals a light pole directly across from a basketball hoop. I was told that there was another light brightly illuminating the area near the garage door, but I couldn't see it from my vantage point. The driveway was approximately 50 feet long. These images were captured from inside a car just as the witness would have seen them. For the privacy of the residents who were not interviewed, I blurred out the house and license plate numbers. It makes me wonder if they have any idea about what lurks around their house at night. The witness described a bizarre creature that he estimated to be about the size of a man. It had brown, leathery skin, but had regular animal hair on the head, neck, and chest. He mentioned a canine head with a long muzzle and pointed ears on top. According to him, the legs were dog-like, but the arms appeared man-like. Interestingly, the creature stood in an unusual pose, similar to a yoga position called intense side stretch. The witness said that instead of forming a V-shape, the creature's legs formed more of a horseshoe shape, which made sense if they were canine-type legs.
The creature's arms hung down in front, but the witness wasn't sure if they were touching the ground or its own foot. Strangely, the creature didn't move but kept one eye on the witness, maintaining a profile view. The witness reported a sort of sneer on the creature's face, as if it were saying, You see me, don't you? He said the overall feeling about this creature was that it was bad news. The witness and the creature stared at each other for about a minute, with the creature remaining in place, just looking at him. Eventually, the witness continued on his duty up the road. When he returned about eight minutes later, the creature had vanished. I was taken to the water tank, which employees must attend every morning at 4 a.m. As the crow flies, this tank is only about a hundred yards from where the sighting occurred. This is where the witness was heading at the time of the sighting. The employee goes there alone each morning at 4 a.m., drives up to the locked gate, opens it, then walks into the enclosure to open a valve on this tank. On the right side of the driveway is a dense hedge of trees and honeysuckle. On the other side of that hedge is a small field with an outbuilding and parking lot, followed by the road, and on the opposite side, the house where the sighting took place. To the right of the tower is mostly farmland. One can feel quite isolated in the dark at this tank. My friend pointed out that going into the gate to the tank isn't bad, but on the way back, your headlights are in your face, making it hard to see. For some time before the sighting, the witness had expressed his uneasiness about coming to this particular location. He always felt like something was watching him. It's worth noting that this witness is far from a coward and is actually known for being a bit of a badass. However, he had long felt uncomfortable about coming here in the dark. The locations of this tank, the water treatment facility in the sighting, are very close to a state park. A wildlife area, a lake, a large creek, and railroad tracks. Unfortunately, I haven't yet obtained permission from the witness for a direct interview, but I'm still holding out hope. This information comes from my friend who works with the witness. I encountered a reptilian hybrid several years ago while attending college in Oregon. This individual was extremely manipulative with words and dangerous with its deeds. Once I told him that he was a cold-blooded bastard after he humiliated a friend, he became very angry, staring at me with a hideous glare. He said I would suffer for my disrespect. That night, while studying in my dorm room, I was alarmed by a shadowy figure starting to manifest. I am sensitive to energy so I immediately started to raise the vibration in the room. It quickly dissipated. That startled me, so I was on full alert. Later that night, at approximately 2 a.m., I awoke from what I thought was a dream, but alarmed by a grotesque reptilian form on top of my body attempting to choke me. It screeched and wailed like it was taking great delight in my fear and pain. I struggled and finally threw the fiend off me. As it cowered on the floor, glaring at me, I immediately knew it was the individual I had insulted earlier. It thrust itself at me. I reached for my pants on my desk chair to retrieve my pocket knife. It was choking me as I pulled the weapon from my pants pocket and toiled to open the blade. I was able to push it off, long enough to slash it across its left arm and upper chest. With a howl of rage, it ran to the wall and disappeared through it. I turned the light on to fully illuminate the room and noticed blood on the knife, bed sheets, and floor. I checked myself to make sure it wasn't my blood. I was awake the rest of the night and ready to strike if I needed to defend myself. I was exhausted in the morning but made my way to class. I noticed the individual coming out of his dorm room. He had a bandage on his left arm in the same spot where I had cut the reptilian. He noticed me and walked directly to me, nose to nose. He glared at me with those evil reptilian eyes. Watch your back, because this isn't over, he murmured. I walked past him and made my way to class. Later that day, the dorm staff and housing administrators wanted to talk to me. While I talked to one of the dorm staff regarding this individual, the administrator blurted out, Don't provoke him. It's important that you not cause trouble for him. The dorm staff was obviously terrified of this guy and behaved like his minions. 
This was startling. That same night I felt wary of a presence watching me. That sense of dread continued for several weeks until I moved off campus to avoid this hostile individual. However, I often noticed him and his acquaintances blatantly watching me when I was on campus and in town. I know that I wasn't the only person affected by this guy, but no one ever dared to discuss it. Many strange things happened as well, including the sudden death of two students in that same dorm. No details of those deaths were ever disclosed, just that they died because of medical reasons. I know others are out there who are aware of the reptilians and that there are ways that humanity can use to defend itself against them. I have been fortunate to meet several people who safeguarded themselves and family. These terrible beings are a scourge that we will continue to confront. Be safe, Mason. My name is Tommy, and I've always been drawn to the mysterious and the unexplained. One summer, when I was just 14, my life took a turn I could never have anticipated. It all began with a camping trip to Browning's campground, a serene retreat in the heart of Versailles, Indiana. My family and friends had joined me for what should have been an ordinary adventure, but little did I know that our lives would be forever changed by the enigmatic creatures we would encounter that night. The campfire crackled, casting its warm, flickering light across our faces as we sat huddled around it. It was a typical evening with laughter and stories filling the air. But as the night wore on, I couldn't help but feel an unsettling sense of unease. It was as though something in the woods was watching us, waiting to reveal itself. My gaze wandered toward the forest edge, and what I saw sent shivers down my spine. Two creatures, unlike anything I had ever seen, stood there in the shadows, their fiery red eyes glowing with an eerie intensity, locked onto our group. They were colossal with the body of a man but the head of a wolf, and their fur was as black as the night itself. I was the first to notice them, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I stammered, trying to alert my companions, who turned to see the unearthly beings before them. We watched in terrified awe as the creatures slowly retreated into the darkness, vanishing like specters. The memory of their red eyes would haunt my dreams for years to come. Over the next decade, the mystery of Browning's campground continued to unravel. Two of my cousins, not much older than I was when I first encountered the dogmen, had their own chilling experience. They described seeing a creature similar to what I had witnessed, but with a different shade of fur, a menacing gray. The years passed, and more accounts of these elusive beings began to surface. Last summer, during a lively campground party, a group of revelers claimed to have seen one of these creatures lurking near their campsite. It was tall, dark, and just as menacing as the ones my cousins and I had witnessed. The red eyes, a common thread in these accounts, seemed to hold an ancient and eerie wisdom that defied explanation. As the reports continued to pile up, our small town couldn't ignore the mounting evidence and the accounts of its residents. The term dogman began to circulate, a moniker for these enigmatic beings that had become an intrinsic part of the folklore of Versailles, Indiana. For my family, Browning's campground had been a cherished summer tradition, but it had also become a place of mystery and unease. Every visit held the potential for another encounter with the dogman. And while some might dismiss our stories as mere campfire tales, those fiery red eyes were etched into our memories, a reminder that there are mysteries in this world that defy explanation and continue to haunt us to this day. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.